Good evening. Okay, hold on. Everybody's in. Okay. Okay. Bezos Hashem. I had tremendous shout to the Shmaya to get here because uh, they closed off the whole 878 and uh, there was traffic, the whole Nassau Expressway, at least an hour and a half from the motor vehicles. Major but, accident. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Major accident. They had to helicopter people to the uh, right. hospital. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So, but, but, but it turns out that I, I happened to have bought a bike today. And it was in my uh, in my in the back of my car, and uh, I was able to get into the stop and shop parking lot and pull out my bike. <laughs> what would have taken me another hour to get home, and I certainly would have not made it in time, it took me ten minutes. So, siyata dishmay and yours chus. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. I hope everybody's okay there. All right, Tana Rabbanam. Today's daf is daf Lamed Dalid. And we will begin from uh, 10 lines in the bottom, Tana Rabbanam. Uh, uh, the rabbis taught, Ketzad over Yisrael es Hayarde. How did the Jews cross the Jordan River? How did the Jews cross the Jordan River? And remember that the, the Yardane split just like it split by Yamsuf, albeit differently. Um, the the Yarden did not go uh, did, did not did not split uh, in in half like like the Yamsuf the Yarden split it just stopped running and it formed one wall and the rest of the water went further back went uh, went further down that's why it says Malachayon Kisanus Hayarden Tisoiv Laochar remember that the, the difference between the Yamsuf was that it each one ran away. So each side ran away. So you had a wall from uh, from the right and left, there was a wall. With the Jordan, when the Jews crossed the Jordan, in the time of Yeshua, the, just, the water stopped running and the rest of the water just continued on. So that formed a pathway for the Jews to cross the Jordan. So the Gemara asks, we're, we're beginning Daf Lama Gimel on the base, 10 lines from the bottom. Tana Rabbana, Ketzad over Yisrael Siyarin. How did the Jews cross the Jordan River? The whole yom, every single day, Oray Noisea Achashne de Golem. The Ora was in the center. Basically, um, they basically they were like uh, each the each there were four. There was actually four. Um, for every three shvatim, there was a a flag. Okay, that's in Parshas Bamidbar. Every three shvatim had a flag. So basically, six shvatim ran in front of the Oran when they traveled in the desert. The Oran was in the center. And behind it was two other flags, you know, two two other six shvatim that went behind. And as you remember, Don was the last of the shvatim, and that's how they went uh, uh, crossing in the in the in the desert. But here, so the Oren was in the center. So bechol yom Oren naseya achash ne the golem. Every day the uh, the the Oren would go after two to the golem. But hayoyim today, uh hayoyim nasat chila. For, for the, when they crossed the Jordan, the the Oren was jumped in first, so to speak. Shnema, as the pasuk says, "Hine Aroin, it's to say for Yeshua, Hine Aroin bris Aroin, bris kol aretz over lefnechem." It's going, trans, uh, uh, it's it's passing before you to lead the way. And the chol yom yom, the chol yom yom, any day during the Jews traveling, Leviim nois in this Aron. There were Leviim carrying the Aron. Particularly from Shevet from Bnei Kohas, Shevet, Shevet Levi, and the Bnei Kohas from that Shevet. Vahayoim, the day that they crossed the, the Jordan, the Suuhu Kahanim, the Kahanim were the ones carrying it, carrying the Orin. Shnema, Pasuk says, Vahoya Kinoyach Kapis Raglia Kaham Noise Aroin Hashem. When the feet of the Kahanim uh, rested, they were the ones carrying the Orin Hashem. Tanya, we learned in Abraisa. Rabbi Yaisi Aimer, Rabbi Yaisi says, "Bishloisha makoymes nasu hakahanim as orin." There were three places where the kahanim carried the orin. What are the three places? Kisha avru es hayardain. When they crossed the Jordan, that's when they um, that's when they uh, carried the orin, crossing the Jordan. Ukesehsibu, as we just discussed, ukesehsibu es yurichai. When they surrounded the yurichai. Uh, they were trying to capture the city of Yerichai. So every day they went around once around the wall with the Oren leading, with the Oren there leading the way, and it was being carried by the Kahanim. 
And on, on the seventh day, they went around seven times. So again, the Kahanim were carrying the Oren, not the normal people who carried the Oren, which was Shevet Levi. When they finally brought the, the Oren back to, into the base of Migdash, you see the Oren during, after, the, after it was captured by the Plishtim, went on a, a different uh, trail. And it was located in a different place. And finally it was brought uh, to, after the destruction of Shiloh, it was brought to the city of David until Shlomo built the base of Migdash. And then he built the Kodesh Kedoshim and he made a wall behind the Kodesh Kedoshim that was called the Amatraxin. And there, the Pasuk says, they brought, the Kahanan brought the Arain into the Kodesh Kedoshim. Okay? The cave, um, now, we're discussing, we're going to the Lamedad and Lamedal. And it's fascinating because it discusses exactly what went on when the Jews crossed the Jordan. The cave in Ragli Kahanan as soon as the Kahanan uh, dipped their feet in the water, the water turned backward. It stopped running. So normally the water of a river flows from the higher level to the lower level. So this stopped flowing. The, the water stood, that was generally flowing downward, stood up. And it rose up to be one wall. It rose up into be the wall. So now the Gemara is going to ask, how high was that wall? So the Kama Goyvish Shalmaim, how high was that wall? So the Gemara says, Shneim Asa Mil, Al Shneim Asa Mil. It was 12 miles wide uh, by 12 miles high. Kinegid Machni Yisrael, corresponding to the camp of Yisrael. You see, the camp of Yisrael had to cross the Jordan. So the wall had to, the water had to stop flowing enough for the, the Klal Yisrael to cross the Jordan. So how big is Klal Yisrael? The, the width of Klal Yisrael, if you put all the population of Klal Yisrael from the people that were in the desert, it was 12 mile by 12 mil. So therefore, the water stopped uh, and, and rose up a height of 12 mil by 12 mil. So says Rabbi Yehuda. So this is a very odd statement. said, According to you, Rabbi Yehuda, Adam Kal, who is swifter? Who walks faster? Water or people? If you take the average uh, speed of a, of a human being is about like three and a half miles, right? That you're walking. But Oymayim Kal, water is, is swifter. It moves faster. So therefore, even during the time that the period crossed the, the, the Jordan, the, the wall should have rose up much higher than 12 mil by 12 mil. Have Oymayim Kal, because the water moves faster, and, and if, the, if, if it only rose up to 12 mil by 12 mil and then it collapsed and came bone, mayim, vishayt, vinaisen, then the water would have came, came down and flooded the Jewish people. Ella, so he, he has a different opinion. Malame teaches you, the, the water was piling up and uh, one on top of another. Keeping, keeping one bundle, so to speak, on top of another bundle, one pile on top of another pile. Yoser mishloish meismil. The wall, the water wall, was more than 300 miles. That's basically to outer space. That's, that's uh, according to the literal translation, calculation of, Jew, of the Gemara, shloish meismil is almost to outer space. Achiro oisam, they saw it. You see, the, everybody saw it. Who saw it? Kol malchi mizrach all the, the Shiva Sa'amim, those nations that were living in Israel, the kingdoms of the East and the West, they saw that, that wall of water. Shunema, because the Pasuk says, Bahi Kishmoya. Actually, the Pasuk says they heard about it, but it, the Gemara says they actually saw it. Kol Malchi Amari, all the kings of Amari saw. Ashebe'eva Yadem Yoma, that were on the west side of the Jordan. The Jews crossed over from the east of the Jordan towards west. And they heard the the Emirim heard, and all the kingdoms of Kahanim, Ashal Yom, uh, uh, that was that was by the Mediterranean Sea, the Kananim there. So basically, there were thirty-one kingdoms in Israel, and they heard They heard about how the Jordan got dried up until the Jews crossed over by Yimas and their hearts melted away. They didn't have any uh, spirit to fight against the B'nai Israel. 
So that's how uh, we know that uh, that how high that the wall must have been so high that the Malchem Mir, uh, Mizrach Amarav, who are miles away from the Jordan, were able to see a a pile a a wall of water. And then it's not it's not so uncommon. Ba'af Rochav Azoyna, Rochav Azoyna, who was in who was who was harbored the two Chofni and Pinchas, the two spies that came to spy out Israel before the Jews crossed the Jordan. They were sent by Yeshua. She harbored them and protected them. She told Omri, she said, Lishlucha Yeshua to the messengers of Yeshua. It was not it was it was Kalev and Pinchas. He shamanu. That we heard, Ace Asher Hoivish Hashem is Mayamsu. We heard that uh, how the, the 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 Jews were how Hakadosh Baruch Hu dried up the waters of the Yamsu. Probably they also saw a wall rise up in the in the sky of the Yamsu rising up. Uksiv the pasuk says, Vanishma, we heard it, Vayimas Lovavenu Vlakama Oiv, and they didn't have any any guts uh, to to uh, they lost the spirit to the fighting spirit to fight the Bnei Yisrael when they arrived into uh, after crossing the Jordan. The Pesach describes that while they were still in the Jordan and uh, there was like a, a break in the action and maybe Hamdul Yeshua got on the megaphone and he said, Yeshua. Yeshua says to the Jewish people, Du'u, recognize this, for what purpose are you crossing the Jordan? You have to recognize this that it's not easy. You have to you have to motive, be self motivated and self confident that you're going to be able to to drive out all the the inhabitants of this land. You have to have in mind on the condition that you're crossing this Jordan so that you will have the courage to drive out all the inhabitants of this land before you. Shinama, because the pasuk says. And after you cross the Jordan, you're going to drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. If you, if you so to speak, visualize that in your mind, then muta, that's good. But if you're not going to self-actualize and manifest that you're going to win this war, that's very important. It's a fascinating thing. The water will come and flood both of us. Both, both of us. My Oisichem, what did Yeshua mean by it's going to flood both of us? Oisi the Eschem, me and you. In other words, you don't need me as your leader if you're not going to be able to manifest courage and self confidence of driving out these people. Then the then Oidim Medavri Yarden, while they were still in the Jordan, Amalehem Yeshua, Yeshua said, Harimu Lechem Ish Evan Achas Al Shechmoy, Lemispar Shifta Yisrael. He told 12 people to lift up a stone from the, from the Jordan. A very heavy stone, and we're going to learn that the the human the humans at that time were were huge people and very very strong, and so the first thing Yeshua is going to ask, I want you to lift very heavy stones, large stones, and leave them in the Jordan River, so that so that uh, there will be twelve stones as a simon, as a sign that the Jews crossed the Jordan River. And God made the Jordan River dry up. So the Pasuk says, That will be a sign amongst you. When your kids will ask you, What are these stones? So apparently these stones were stood up in the Jordan River and they protruded out of the water. So that when you're on land, you can see 12 stones lined up in the Jordan River. And that your kids are going to ask you, why are there 12 stones lined up? And you'll be able to define them you were able to define, tell them about the story of the Jews crossing the Jordan River. Similar bonum that should be assigned to your children. That the fa- that the um, that the fathers uh, crossed the Jordan River, and I guess if they would send out submarines, like they have to look for the for the Malaysian airline somewhere, if they uh, scour the ground of the Jordan River, you will find stones there that were set up uh, underneath the water. Again, besides setting up those stones, they were to take another 12 stones and, and take it with them out of the Jordan. Yeshua said, Carry from the Jordan, for where the Kahanim were standing, a prepared Shtem Esrei Avonim, the 12 stones. So they now that they're going to take uh, like souvenirs, 12 big stones, 
from the Jordan and carry it with them. Where are they going to bring it? You carry it with you. You should take it with you on the place where you're going to um, you're going to overnight. In every encampment, they had these stones with them. Only the first night where, where you're going to encamp, that's where you should leave the stones. So basically, after the Jews crossed the Jordan River, as we learned before, they went to Har Grizim and Har Abel, and they did the whole ceremony there of, of the covenant. And then they settled down in this place called Gilgal. And in the Gilgal, they set up the 12 stones, and that was a, that's what they took out from the Jordan River. Alma Rabbi Yehuda, Abba Chalafta, Rabbi Lozab ben Masya, Vechananya ben Chachinai, there are three Amaroim who, who are like um, assessing the weight of the stones. You need three people to agree on, on what the probable weight of these stones that the Jews carried out from the, what were the weight of the stones that the Jews carried out from the Jordan River. Amdu al Oisin Avonim, they, they estimated on those stones. Maybe they, they at that time of the Amaraim, they knew where the stones were. So they estimated the stones, Vishi Aram, and they measured it. Each one had the mass of 40 saw. So that's a huge weight. Maybe they, each one was an Amma by an Amma, the height of, uh, of, of three Amas, which is the size of a mikvah. And so they're massive, massive stones, but they're being carried by one person. So 12 stones, each one being carried by one person. And so to give you an idea how strong the people who were doing the lifting, Ugmiri, we have a, we have a tradition that to une the midli inish le a a a load that a person puts on his shoulder by a dead lift, that you lift it off the ground, right? That you yourself lift it off the ground is tilted the to une haba. It's just one third what somebody could load on your shoulder. If you had somebody lower, low, loading something on your shoulder, you can carry three times as much. So basically, if these, if these uh, people carried 40 saw of a stone, then technically they had the strength to carry a stone uh, weighing 120 saw had somebody lifted it and put it on their shoulder. So now the Gemara just digresses, and this will lead us to another topic. Mekan ata mechashiv le'eshkol. From here, you can see how the, 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 the great cluster that the Jews brought back, the Meraglim brought back to, to show the Jewish people, how big was that? Shunema, the Pasuk says, They needed two people to carry it on a stick. So the Gemara asks, that they were carrying in a stick, that means the cluster was hanging on a stick and you needed two people to carry it. Of course, a stick means one carries it from one end and another carries it from the other end. Any a day should be not shnayim. Of course, I know it's two sticks. Ma tamad loyme bishnayim. Why do, why does it say two? So bishnayim doesn't mean two people. Bishnay moitis. It means two sticks. And actually, we're going to learn that there that w- there were more than just two sticks. Omar biyitzcha tu tonei the tu tonei the tu tonei. That two sticks a load and underneath another load. Al keitzat. How do you get it? So look at the picture on the screen over here. Basically, if you see it over here, this is how they carried the grape. You'll have eight Miraglim just carrying this cluster of grapes. It was a crisscross of, of sticks and actually uh, two sticks. And then uh, Rabbi Yitzchak said there was another two sticks on top of that, forming an X. So it made it uh, making space for eight people just to carry the cluster of grapes. So Shmaina Nasa Eshkol, Eight of the Maraglim carried a cluster of grapes. Echad nasa rimoin, and one carried a pomegranate. The echad nasa teina, and one carried this large fig. I mean, it, it weighed a ton. And uh, basically, they were, they were trying to show the people how, how large the fruits of the land are. So you could imagine how massive the people are. And that would, uh, and they were trying to inspire fear into, uh, incite fear into the people, the Jewish people, so they'll lose their courage and, and willpower to go in to take over Eretz Yisrael. That was the Atzasa Maraglam. The idea of the Maraglam war to convince the Jewish people they're not worthy for God to do such a great miracle uh, of let the, letting them overtake this uh, seemingly impossible uh, uh, war. So Yehushua, so eight of ten of the Maraglam did carried fruit. Yeshua and Kalev did not carry anything. 
Why didn't they carry anything? If I want, I can tell you, because they were, even to the other Miraglim, the other Miraglim did not want Yeshua and Kalev to carry anything because they were important. But Yeshua, especially, was the assistant of Moshe Rabbeinu. So they knew that Yeshua is much more important. So they didn't want to give him an assignment to carry some fruit. The Yibai is saying, if I want, I can tell you that they themselves didn't want to carry fruit. They did not follow, they didn't want to get any involvement in this plan to try to convince the Jewish people not to, to proceed in Tarit Yisrael. So therefore, they didn't want to carry any fruit. Although Moshe Rabbeinu told them, but they, they didn't want to do that because it was going to lead to what it did lead to. So the Gemara just gets back, gets back for a moment to the Jews crossing the Jordan, and then we'll get back to the story of the Meraglim. There's an argument, uh, regarding that 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 we learned before between Yud and Rab Lezer uh, of how high was the water was when they crossed the Jordan. So they explained the Machlaikis. Chadam, one explained the Machlaikis, Lidivri Rabbi Yehuda, according to Rabbi Yehuda, who says that the wall was height, 12 mil by 12 mil. We go to Lamedal and Lamed Beis, Hani Yosunavu, that the Jews crossed, uh, crossed it like they like a, a one camp, they crossed it. And they crossed, the whole group crossed at the same time. So therefore, the wall was only 12 miles by 12 miles. The Divivri Rabbi Lazar Bar Shimem, according to Rabbi Lazar Bar Shimem, the reason why the wall was so high that it went to outer space, because he learns that the Jews crossed the, the Jordan River one after another. So a single file. So if you do cross a single file, it takes a lot longer to cross the Jordan. And therefore the water was stopped for a longer period of time that it was able to mount a wall, to raise the wall very high into outer space. The Chadoma, now this is, no, that's not the Machloik, it's between Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shemin. Beimar, Beimar, Kechen Yosun. Everybody agrees that they crossed the, the, the Jordan like a normal camp. You know, two, uh, you know, six, uh, six uh, Shvatim and one, and, uh, and then followed by another six Shvatim. So it, it's, it, it was wide, and they crossed it like they normally uh, 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 traveled in the desert. But Mar Savar, Odom Kal. One says that the man can walk just as fast as the water. Mar Savar, Mayim Kal, that the water was faster, and therefore it had to be a higher wall. It doesn't mean that the, that the others, uh, that Rabbi Yehuda held that the, the man is faster than water, but in this case, it could be because it's going anti-gravity. It's, 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 it's holding itself back. So maybe it, it, the water slowed down and therefore it wasn't that high as uh, more than 12 miles by 12 miles. Now the Gemara just gets back into the end of the daf uh, regarding the Miraglim. The, the, the Pasuk begins the story of the Miraglim, of the spies, God said to Moshe, send on your behalf people to spy the land. So whose idea was it that God should send the spies? So it definitely was not God's idea because, because God would not uh, put a plan up there where it, was, it, would, it would be a sure failure. So whose idea and whose desire was it to send the, to send the Miraglim? Amr HaShlakish HaShlakish says, that's what it says, Shlach Lecha, Medaitcha, it's your idea to send the spies. That's what God hinted to Moshe Rabbeinu, if you want, you can send the spies. And, and God was like uh, agreeing to this plan because hoping that if you see God is okay with you sending the spies, maybe you won't send the spies. It's like, it's like if you need to, if you're buying a car and the guy says you can test drive and drive it to, to wherever you want, you don't need to test drive it. If he's so confident, uh, then you're ready to purchase it, even without test driving it. So Hashem said, if you want, send Baraklam. I'm not telling you to do it, but if you want, you can do it. Because God could not have come that up with that plan. Would God choose a bad uh, a portion for himself? In other words, why would he come up with this plan, which automatically led to failure? That's why when, when Moshe Rabbeinu reviewed the whole story of the Miraglim in Sefer Devarim, he said, Vayita this idea was good in my eyes. Amr Ashlakish Ashlakish says, Moshe Rabbeinu stressed, Be'ena, in my eyes it was good, Veloi Be'ena of Shomakim, not in the eyes of the Lord. Now the Pasik says, Vayachburu es ha'aret, Vayachburu lan es ha'aret. In Devarim, when Moshe Rabbeinu was telling over the story of the Meraglim, he says the story that we, I sent these people to Yachburu lan es ha'aret. They were going to Yachburu. Yachburu is another way to dig for something. But it also means to spy. But that's the unusual 
uh, synonym for the word spy. Uh, the Yaturu uh, should be the spies. It's a hint for another word. They were only uh, looking to look at the, the, the faults of Eretz Yisrael. Because Ksiv Hoch, it says over here, they should search the, uh, the land. When God will make his appearance, those that serve the moon and those that serve the sun, uh, sun will be totally shamed. So you see the word Chafra is a shaming, to look, uh, to be shamed. So when, when they were looking to be the Meraglim, they weren't just spying. They were looking to find faults into Eretz Yisrael. That was the plan of the Meraglim. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu used the odd synonym when he was telling over the story to describe the story of the Meraglim. Then the Pasuk says, In the Parsha Shlach, it says you, their names. So it really says the word Shmoisam twice. So you learn a fascinating thing. From this story, from the fact that the Torah says these are their names, these are their names twice. We have a tradition from our fathers. The Miraglim were actually had names that indicated their, their ill attentions. And actually, their names somehow influence what they what they ended up doing. We can only define one of them how it fits in with the story. One of the spies was named Susir ben Michael. So Susir means a contradict. His name was Susir, the contradictor. He wanted to contradict the actions of God by going against God. Michael means he made God weak. He made God appear weak by expressing to the people that even Loyalenu, that Hashem can't, can't fight this war. He's not strong enough, so to speak. That's how his name was. I can tell you another name. There was another uh, spy named in the Pesukim, Nachbi ben Vossi. His name was Nachbi. Why is his name Nachbi? Shehechbi dvar shalach baruch He hid the words of God. That God, God wanted to uh, show how special the land is, and he hid that fact. Vafsi. The word Vafsi means skipped over. He skipped over one of the characteristics of God. God always speaks the truth or says the truth, is the truth. And he tried to, to create lies out of the whole thing. So that's why his name is Nachbi ben Vafsi. So we see, uh, unfortunately, that yeah, a person has to be careful what kind of name you give your, your children because they ha- it also has an influence on how their life is going to turn out. So we got to go, go with the traditional names. Then the Pasuk says, They went up south, and then he came to Hebron. So didn't they all the Meraglim go together? So why doesn't it say, They all came to Hebron. Amarava, Rava said, It teaches you, Kalev separated from the advice of the Meraglim, from the plan of the Meraglim, and he went, He spread himself out, onto the Kvarim of the, of the fathers. Apparently, this word v'nishtatach probably means he went on the gravesite and prostrated himself down. Uh, and we see that you're permitted to, to pray on gravesites, uh, asking them to ask God for assistance. Amalehen Avaisai, Avram Yitzchak Yaakov, my forefathers, Bakshur Lai Rachmim Shem Raglam. Ask God for mercy that it should be saved from the plan of the Meraglam. In other words, you should, uh, Kalev want to be protected. And therefore, a person, although Hakobadei Shemayim, Chutz Me Shemayim, you can pray for Yer Shemayim for divine assistance that you shouldn't fall in. Yeshua, why did Yeshua go pray there? It's a good idea. You see, he already was certain that Moshe prayed on his behalf. And therefore, he had no reason to go to a grave. So if you have no reason to go to a cemetery to pray, don't go. And that's why Yeshua didn't go, because he was confident that he's not going to fall in. Chinema, because the Pasuk says, Vayikra Moshe, Moshe prayed. This Vayikra means he prayed. By calling Hashem Benun, Yahshua, he gave him a little extra Yud to his name, and, and implying, God will save you from the advice of the, from the plan of the Meraglim. Hainu Diksiv, because because Kalei prayed on the, on the caver in Hebron, Avdi Kalev Akev Hoysa Ruach Acheres Imai, because Kalev turned around and in a different spirit than the rest of the Meraglim, he was gifted the city of Hebron. That's how uh, that's how uh, the Pasuk ends over there. 
Vesham, Achim Hashem and Talmud. The Pasuk describes that when the Jews arrived in Israel, we don't have any, I don't know, uh, archaeological evidence for this, but the Torah describes that there were massive giants that roamed the our world. And the way Rashi describes it, that there were ex extraterrestrials that came down and, uh, and had relations with humans, and these giants were born. Achimain Sheshev Talmud. Achiman is, is a giant. His name is Miyuman Shebe'achev. He was like the strongest of the brothers. Like the right hand is the stronger hand. Sheshai, Shemesim Aris Kishchasais. When he walked, his name was Sheshai. He made the earth full of um, imprints, so to speak, of pits as he walked because he was so heavy. Talmai, why was his name Talmai? Mounds. Shemesim was Aris Tlum and Tlum. When he walked, earth, earth, flew out from his footsteps and formed bounds all around his footsteps. And we skipped this Dovaracha. Achiman bona anas, the word Achiman, this he built the city anas, Sheshe bona olish, Sheshe built olish, Talmai bona atalbish. So each one of these giants, again, these are massive human beings, built cities, and they're called the Elide Anak, the children of the Anak. Why are they called children of this Anak? Why was the, the father giant called Anak? That they, um, that they, 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 the earth looks like, a, the sun looks like a necklace around their neck because they're so tall. They look like they're taller than the sun. Then the Pesach says, and we'll find a fill, finish up with this, the Chevrim Shavim Nivnesa. The Torah describes in the, when the Maraglim were spying the land, this, that Chevrim was built seven years prior to Tzoyan Mitzrayim. So the Gemara doesn't understand. How could you say that Chevrim was built seven years earlier than Mitzrayim? that it was really built up prior to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. How is it possible that somebody builds a house for his, for his younger son before his older son? I guess, presuming his older son will get the first city that he builds. Now, who is the, who is the father of Mitzrayim? Chom. Chom, who came out of the Teva, he had a, he had, his older son was Cush, and his next son was Mitzrayim. And then his last son, his baby, was Canaan. So Mitzrayim seemed to have, he would have probably come, given, uh, built up Mitzrayim, giving it to his son, his older son, prior to building up Eretz Yisrael, prior to building up Hebron, and giving that to his younger son. So how could the Torah say Hebron was built before Mitzrayim? Ella, what the, Mara, what the Pasuk needs to say is, It was seven times better than Soyan. The fruits of Hebron were seven times better than Soyan. The Eilechot Trashim Bechol Eretz Yisrael, there's no a rocky uh, terrain in Israel more than Hebron. Hebron is the rockiest terrain. The Kavri Beishchivi, because there are cemeteries located there. The Eilechot Mu'ula Bechol Eretz Yosem Eretz Yosem Eretz There's no, nothing better in all the, in the lands of, of, of the world more than Egypt. The food there is delicious. The garden of, of, of God is located in Eretz Mitzrayim, the land of Mitzrayim. And the best place of, in the land of Mitzrayim is yes, the Mitzrayim, is Tzoyan. The, the, the higher ministers and the kings lived in Tzoyan, or they, they at least vacationed there. So Tzoyan is the finest place with the finest produce in all of Egypt, which is the finest produce in the entire world. But nevertheless, the Torah tells us, Hebron had seven times better fruit than, than Soyan. That's what Nivnesa means. It was built up, it, it's seven times more better uh, fruits than you could find in Soyan. Now the Gemara just finishes off with one last question. Was Hebron a rocky terrain? Doesn't the Pasuk say, and Avshalom said, I want to go to Hebron to, to bring Karbonis. Now, why is Avshalom going to Hebron? He's not bringing Karbonis because the Karbonis, are, the, the Mishkan was located in Givon. The Mizbeach was in Givon. So why did he go to Hebron? He wanted to get sheep from Hebron. Now, if sheep uh, are grazing in Hebron, the best sheep in the world are in Hebron, so how, there must be vegetation growing there. So it's not a rocky uh, terrain there. But Tanya, we learned in the Brisa, Elam, the best rams are Mimoya, Kivosim, the best sheep, are Hebron. So it's not a rocky terrain. It probably is a grassy place and, and, and with luscious uh, uh, vegetation. Hence, is the Gemara, yes, Mina. 
because there's no human food there. There's only grass food. I did the kil sha'ara, the klisha, because the, the land is very weak of the raya. It produces grass by itself. The sham and kinyana and, and the and your possessions become fattened up. The sheep become fattened up. So that's why uh, the best the sheep were located in Hebron. Okay, we'll continue about Hashem tomorrow. It makes you want to go to Israel. That's for sure.